been giving me nothing but grief, invited me to give this talk, so we'll see what he has to bribe me with next year, if I ex am expected to do the same. What I was asked to do is to give you a, an update on caneberry nutrient management, and I have a handout at the back, so if uh, some of Tom's helpers can pass that out, I brought enough copies for everyone. Some of Tom's young helpers. Young helpers. So I want to stress that we have a caneberry nutrient management guide, and it is free. Uh, last year we translated it into Russian. And this particular guide gives recommended rates of nitrogen for uh, growing blackberries and raspberries and, and tips for managing nitrogen fertilization in particular related to research that we did in Katata looking at when um, an AY blackberry takes up nitrogen and where it goes and when the best time to fertilize it is and how much of it goes into the floricanes, how much of it goes into the primicanes, and that led to changes in nitrogen management ages ago. It was a graduate student project, and that's related. And I'll, I'll just reiterate that as we go through here. It gives the recommended soil nutrient levels, but what I've done in the handout is, is put this in a little more of a user-friendly uh, format. And all of the other nutrients, other than nitrogen, are uh, based on tissue nutrient sufficiency in an established planting and pre-plant that's based on soil. So please use this as a resource, but realize that we are going to be revising this management guide because we've learned so much more about nutrient management. And it will it'll likely be in a couple of years because we have one more year of data to collect on tissue nutrients that I'll be presenting today. I want to stress three things that I think are extremely important, but I'm not going to spend much time on this. The first is pH. Do not let the pH drop below the recommended zone for cane berries. It's similar for raspberries and blackberries. The reason for this is, it's not unusual to have soil pHs drop below 5.6 in our region. And it's an extremely important to have pH in the correct range, simply because nutrients are in a form that the blackberry plant can take up better, but also because if you're fertilizing with the cheaper forms of nitrogen, which some growers are doing, like urea, urea is an ammonium form of fertilizer. And if you fertilize with ammonium nitrogen and the pH is high, where it should be for cane berries at 6, that ammonium source will rapidly nitrify to nitrate. And blackberry and raspberry plants take up the nitrate form of nitrogen, not ammonium. If you fertilize uh, with the ammonium forms of nitrogen and your pH is drifted low to 5.5, it stays in that ammonium form for a long time. And that means that the plant may not have the nitrogen it needs at the right time. It will ultimately nitrify to nitrate, but will it be at the right time when the plant needs it? And that's really important to understand because blackberries do not take up the ammonium form. Blueberries do. And that's why blueberries are adapted to a low pH. So that's important. Secondly, test the soil before planting. This is the time to change the pH. This is the time to modify the nutrients within the till zone. Make sure you sample to the right depth. But for a long-lived perennial crop like blackberries and raspberries, there's, it's really important to also look at tissue tests. So the caneberry sufficiency levels, as well as the other crops, are in your handout. So I'm going to skip through this and uh, not spend time on it. Tissue testing is what's the most useful for a perennial fruit crop. And what we recommend in raspberries and blackberries is to sample the most recent fully expanded leaf. That's about a foot or so down from the tip of the primocane in a raspberry or in a blackberry, whether it be a trailing type or an erect or semi-erect type. Now keep in mind that erect and semi-erect blackberries, you'll tip these during the growing season to cause branching. And then you're stuck because as soon as you, if that branching has a weird timing relative to the re recommended sampling time of leaves, 
It can throw off your nutrient levels if those branches are rapidly growing at the time that you're sampling. So that can throw things off and it's something to be aware of. We have standards for leaf nutrient content. These are in your handout, so no need to go over these individual numbers. And notice that the cayberry numbers, it doesn't matter whether it's a black raspberry, a red raspberry, a trailing blackberry, erect or semi-erect. Does that make sense? I don't know. Worldwide, the same standards are used for raspberries, primacane or summer bearing, and for blackberries. So one of the key questions that we've had, and we is myself and David Bryla and all the people we work with, is whether or not this is the way it should be. Should different types of cane berries have different standards? And even more fine-tuned is should different cultivars have different standards? Or should we raise flags of cultivars should be different? Certain cultivars may not fit within the recommended standard. The other thing that I really want to stress is that the correct sample time is late July to early August in our area. That means that if you are sending a tissue sample to a lab or someone is, is collecting one for you and sending it to a lab, when you get recommendations back, look carefully because most labs make the mistake of sending your recommendations back, your levels, your results, and they'll give you recommendations. They'll say, oh, your nitrogen is too high. Or, your calcium is too low. You need to put calcium on. But they are not changing their recommendations because of the sampling time. These standards, which they are using, only work if the tissue is sampled between late July and early August. And let me show you why. So here is summer bearing red raspberry. Look at the nitrogen. This is primocane nitrogen concentration. Here's when we recommend sampling. What would happen if you sent leaves in in the spring? The lab would come back and go, whoa, your leaf levels. That is normal. It is normal for leaf nitrogen to start high early season and to decline. And the reason we recommend sampling here and why the standards are based at that time is because the levels are relatively flat. <coughs> Perfectly flat in this case, but relatively flat. Notice also that cultivars are differing. Here's potassium. Look how much it drops from spring to, to the recommended sampling time. So, what we did is we submitted uh, a proposal to the Oregon Raspberry and Blackberry Commission because not only were we curious about whether cultivars differed, but we were curious about whether there should be a difference between the erect, like Washita and Natchez and Navajo, or semi-erect, like Chester and Triple Crown, as compared to all the trailing blackberries. And we have a lot of new ones. And all of our standards that we use for blackberry are based on Marion. And we have, a, as we all know, Marion leaves just look different, don't they? They always look a little lighter green than many of the other cultivars that we have. So we were uh, very interested in looking at tissue nutrient concentrations over the season to see if we should recommend a different sampling time for different blackberries that fruit at different times. This is a question I always get. Should I sample Chester at a different time than Marion? Because they fruit at such different times. Presently, our standards are for the same time of year. Uh, and it seems intuitive uh, that they might differ, but do they? So I'd like to, uh, Amanda's in the audience. Amanda, raise your arm. Yeah, she hates having her picture this big on the screen. But Amanda's a new research assistant working with me. Many of you know Gil, and he's here somewhere too. Are you still Gil? Yes. Gil is retiring. Everybody go, aw. Yeah. Gil is retiring effective July 1st. He's been with me for over 14 years, so I can't be that bad. Since you were 20. 
Huh? Since you were 20. Since I was 20. Yeah, right. <laughs> now you're sucking up. Yeah, I don't want to die. Yeah, that's right. So um, we, we will be looking for a new research assistant. But Amanda is the, the one who took the lead on this particular study. And she's been great. And even though she was trained in viticulture, she now loves berries, as she should. So what we did, we collected blackberry leaves from two different, I'll call them, sites. The first is, uh, because we wanted to work with a lot of different varieties, we started this at the station. And I, I will precede this by saying, this is a first step. I know growers are very interested in can you micromanage tissue and fruit nutrient levels using foliar, foliar fertilizers. I get that question a lot. This to me is a first step leading to getting at that question. What's the best timing? We are also looking at nutrient concentrations in fluoricane so that we can better understand how do those leaves change so we can go to that next step is now how can I modify the fruit? Because that's a question I get a lot. So I'm not going to talk about fluoricane on our leaves, but uh, if you got an ORBC progress report, you will see uh, uh, some of our results about that. So this is a first year study so far. We're repeating that this season. So we have conventionally managed blackberries, and we'll call it in our dental plot at the station. We have trailing erect and semi-erect types in there. They're getting drip irrigated, inorganic, conventional fertilizers, herbicides are used, and it's bare soil, typical kind of. They're managed, the trailing types are managed um, in the, uh, in, uh, AY production, but we're actually sampling the primocanes on plots that are fruiting. So I think that, that should explain it. The organic, we wanted to, okay, how big of a difference does management make? And we figured this is a big management difference. So let's, even though we're not interested really in developing standards, it's kind of interesting to see how different can organic management make. We're using organic fertilizers, in this case fish emulsion, fertigated through the drip. So that's a big difference, because in the, in the demo we're using inorganic granular applied, but they're drip irrigated. Uh, in the organic, we're fertigating through the drip. We have weed mat. That's a huge difference in soil um, temperature, we would expect, and nutrients available, etc. So we have weed mat. Um, and they are every year producing trailing blackberries only. So it's quite different in their management. So how different are these? Um, first, what I'd like to do is focus on trailing blackberries. We have some overlap between the two sites. And let me explain what you're seeing here in these graphs. So this is leaf nitrogen. So this is the percent leaf nitrogen on the y-axis here. These lines show the different cultivars. So here is the organic plot at the station, and here is the conventional. Again, weed mat, bare soil. Black diamond, marion obsidian, and onyx are in the organic. And we have black diamond, marion obsidian, and onyx in the demo, but we also have Columbia star. We wanted to add the new one so we could start learning more about this variety because I, there's a lot of excitement on this variety. The pink bar gives you the rec present recommended sampling time for primocane leaves. And remember, this is primocane tissue. So these are the recommended sampling time range that we give from late July to early August. And the height of this bar is our recommended tissue nitrogen concentration. Is everybody with me on this? Because all these graphs are going to look the same. If you have a question, now would be a good time if you need me to explain it any further. OK. So any values that fall within this bar, if we send the tissues to the lab, and of course this is lab determined, would be within the recommended range. Any values below, like here for black diamond, would be below the recommended standards. So what I want to point out is that black diamond falls below the recommended standards at this sampling time for leaf nitrogen in the organic and in the conventional. 
The black diamond has low leaf nitrogen concentration in general. These are both high yielding fields based on an eyeball uh, in the demo and a uh, yield that we're collecting in the organic. The other thing to point out is that Marion tends to fit within the box in both spaces. Columbia Star tends to be at the low end and Obsidian at both sites is at the high end of leaf nitrogen. So what I'm saying here is that there are cultivar differences in leaf nitrogen concentration. And again, this is one year data. These bars are the fruiting seasons for these different varieties. And of course, they're all trailing, so there's not a lot of difference. But notice that there's not a huge difference. Like there is in summer bearing red raspberry, we don't see a dramatic drop in tissue nitrogen, but there's a steady decline in tissue nitrogen as the season goes on. And what is quite worrisome is within our recommended sampling time range, there's a big difference between whether you sample primate king leaves at the beginning of the recommended sampling period or at the end. We went from near the top of the recommended range to near the bottom of the recommended range within the sampling window at both sites. And so that's a bit of concern, as not so much for are the standards correct, but it's a bit of a concern if you are uh, keeping records on your own farm. It, I would stress that you be consistent in when you're sampling from year to year, uh, particularly for nitrogen. And we've seen this at grower sites. When we have growers managing these varieties, uh, the same, we can see leaf nitrogen vary a lot. And here again, black diamond is at the low end, much lower than Marion and obsidian. And obsidian is at the high end. So we've had this confirmed at commercial grower sites that there are these differences. Was there a question? Yeah. Why are you picking your uh, organics two weeks before on your Marion's? Why are we picking the organics two weeks before? Because they're hand-picked compared to uh, an estimate of the season for machine pick, first of all, on the guard rows, and secondly, these are on weed mat. It might make a bit of a difference. Okay. It is an estimate, the season. Yes. I'm ignoring you, Tom. Uh, and, and this is something I brought up before, but uh, that window is not necessarily going to be the same calendar date every year. It might be more related to plant development from year to year. Are you talking about this bar? Well, that this window? Saying, what, what are you calling a window? you're saying to keep your records consistent from year to ah. year, are you saying to take all your samples on the, whatever, the first day of August every year, or at a certain stage of plant growth every year? The question is, Will this drop be related to calendar date or developmental stage? And I don't know the answer to that yet. And it'll be interesting to see how much that shifts from year to year. It, 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 you'd think it would be phenological, but it might be more related to day length changes. So, well, if it's yeah. phenological, it'd be really tough to keep it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's nitrogen. Here is phosphorus. And we're seeing the same things in blueberry. We're doing this in blueberry also. We're seeing the same things in blueberry, that our berry crops really are not at a, a high phosphorus concentration. And yet the recommended range that we give for phosphorus is much, we never see plants up here. Never. So this might indicate we need to tighten up the phosphorus recommendations. The other interesting thing is the big difference between our conventional and the organic in leaf phosphorus. I find that kind of interesting. And that might be related to weed mat compared to bear. I don't know. So that it, it's, uh, I'll, you know, one year data, I don't feel comfortable jumping to any conclusions. But look at the big cultivar differences again in leaf phosphorus. I find that rather interesting, with again an onyx being at the bottom end in both onyx and black diamond, uh, excuse me, obsidian being at the lower end of both fields. Potassium, there's a lot of potassium in, in blackberry fruit, and we would expect big differences in potassium. So in both 
management styles, we are below the recommended leaf levels for potassium. Does that mean we're deficient, or does it mean our standards are too high for good yield and growth and production? I don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, there is a, the question is how many pounds per acre are we putting on? Oh, it's in the progress report. I'm not going to remember this off the top of my head. Amanda, do you remember? I know. In the, in the organic, we're putting on potassium with the fertilizer. And I think both of them are around 60 pounds of potassium per acre, or K2O per acre. But uh, don't hold me. Hold, they're managed the same, but don't hold me to it. Bernadine, do you know if there's any difference in the pH between the organic and, uh, and the other plot? The question is on soil pH. We are measuring soil fertility uh, at both, it yes. Make a difference in that release factor. It could make a difference, yes. This fertilizer might be a lot different, too, though, because it's regular chemical fertilizer. A fish fertilizer might be a lot different than chemical fertilizer, yes, especially in phosphorus yeah. content. Um, but there wasn't any difference really in phosphorus between the two. <laughs> so, yeah, it's never easy. Okay, so here's, uh, we talked about potassium, but again, look at the cultivar differences between them. And what's interesting is Columbia Star has a much higher leaf potassium content than all the other varieties we presently grow commercially. So that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see if that repeats itself. Calcium, what everybody uh, seems to be very interested in, because they uh, wonder if it will improve fruit firmness if we increase fruit calcium. But this is a leaf, primocane leaf calcium. And what I want to point out is that uh, in many crops, leaf calcium increases from spring as we go later in the season. But what seems to be interesting in these trailing blackberries is that we don't have an a, a very much of an increase late in the season and in, in fact in this organic plot we're declining again and we kind of have the same trend in the conventional so that's really interesting that there's this pattern to leaf uh, calcium but again you can see that there's a big drop in, at both sites depending on the cultivar whether you sample early in the sampling recommended sampling time or later uh, and it, the, in the conventional, we have quite a difference in cultivars, more so than in the organic. Magnesium, we're within standards, but we have a big cultivar differences, particularly in the, in the demo plot. And I'll finish with boron. We did all the nutrients, including aluminum and manganese and sulfur and iron and copper, but I'll just show boron here as, as our micronutrient of most importance. We have, uh, I would say, below rec definitely below recommended standards in the organic plot. That's because our soil boron is quite low. We're having trouble increasing soil boron uh, with granular applications in the organic. Um, and we're not doing foliar because it would have confounded the results. It would have screwed up this experiment. So otherwise, we would be doing foliar. None, none, neither one of these sites has had a foliar fertilizer. So here you can also see, look at the dramatic decrease in leaf boron during the sampling period. So these are things that kind of concern me with regard to recommended sampling time. So I want to just show you now, compare Marion to an erect, the, an erect and semi-erect cultivars, just to show you. These fruit at very different time. What difference does it make on the tissue ni uh, nitrogen? So again, here's the fruiting season window for us. So we have Washita, Triple Crown, and Chester, and Marion. So Marion's in the green, and here's Primacane leaf nitrogen, it nicely shows the decline over the season. I don't know when you'd sample these to get a relatively flat period. Uh, there doesn't seem to be one except in Marion, perhaps, at this time. But you can see that leaf nitrogen is higher on these erect and semi-erect types at that time of year, but they all fall within the present standards. What's interesting is always leaf potassium because of course there's uh, and I'll show you this is a lot of potassium in the fruit 
But despite these having very different fruiting seasons and uh, there being a lot of potassium in the fruit, and remember these are primocanes, we are below the recommended standards in all of these for leaf potassium as we were when we compared all the trailing types. So that definitely deserves a closer look. Calcium. Well, we're all within the standards, but there's a huge difference from whether you sample at the beginning of the season or at the beginning of the sampling period or later. And they're all relatively similar, which is interesting, again, uh, considering they have very different fruiting, zone, uh, fruiting times. So I, I wanted to summarize some things um, that we presently know about fertilize, fertilization in blackberry especially, which is what I was asked to do and then highlight some of the things that we're continuing to look at. So first of all, this is what we learned from work we did in the 1990s. And I've been at OSU over 26 years, so I can start saying ages ago. Um, so here, what we have learned is that this blackberry plant stores a lot of nitrogen in the canes, in the buds, in the crown, and in the roots. And we've actually been able to show that about 30% of the nitrogen that is stored in those plant parts is used for fruiting lateral growth and for fruit production. It's about 30%. The rest comes from new fertilizer nitrogen. So that new fertilizer nitrogen is taken up by the plant when we apply it. It's taken up by the roots and then it moves into these different plant parts. It's going to go in the roots, into the crown, goes into the floricanes, new fertilizer nitrogen goes to the fruit, so if you over fertilize you can actually increase fruit nitrogen concentration perhaps more than it should be. And you can get softer fruit. You can also get longer fruiting laterals with longer inner nodes. You can get laterals laying on top of each other. And this can be an issue, particularly in the Linden area, where over-fertilization leads to all those laterals layering, and they, they get fruit rot, much more fruit rot if that happens in the raspberries. Goes into the fruit, as I mentioned, and then later in the season, it will continue to be taken up into the primocanes, crowns, and roots. And this is really important because we need to reestablish the stored stuff for a sustainable yield, whether it be EY or AY production, we need to get that plant back to getting all the nutrients that it needs um, going back through the winter and into next spring. And so because we were able to fertilize and look to see when the fertilizer was taken up and where, where it goes, this led to uh, changes in our recommendations on when to fertilize, which I'll stress in just a sec. So fertilizer <coughs> nitrogen, for example, we knew then, well, how much is removed in the fruit? How much is removed when we cane out the dying floricanes? And then how much do we lose in the leaves? And what's interesting about blackberries, we were able to show that if you can delay caning out from late August to October, which you can do in a February-trained EY, or in AY, going from an on year to an off year, cutting everything off in October, there is a lot of nitrogen that moves from those dying fruiting canes back into the crowns, and it increases the health of the plant. Because remember, it's not just nitrogen that's moving, it's carbohydrates and all sorts of goodies. So if you can delay that, it's really a, a benefit to the plant. The other thing to remember is that if you're caning out and you're chopping those canes between the rows, that decomposes and is very quickly available to the plants because the blackberry roots go between the rows. So that's recovered and that's a good thing and same with leaves unless they blow out of the field. So what we did was based on that research we revised our caneberry nutrient management guide and we recommended split applications of granular fertilizer if you're doing that and uh, we also recommended, you know, if you're fertigating, dividing up the nitrogen um, so that the plant had that fertilizer nitrogen to take up when it needed to grow. And so new fertilizer nitrogen goes to the new primocanes. You don't want it to be so early that it leaches and, and there's less available. It goes to the primocanes and also to the floricanes. So it goes to both places. 
So what we do with tissue testing, really, is the yields already happened. We're sampling these primocanes in late July, early August. So the advantage to tissue testing is to see, is this plant ready to go for next spring? Is there anything you need to tweak next year to make the plant healthier? So what, this plant is storing all sorts of nutrients, and those are remobilized. They're moved to the fruiting laterals as they grow. So the important thing is to get the plant healthy where it needs to be. So what we've done is we've actually measured what is removed in fruit when we harvest. And we do this to give you a clue as to, well, you know, is this plant really high nutrient demanding? How much nutrient does it need for all this growth? Well, this shows fruit harvest, and this is the amount of nutrient removed per ton of fruit harvested. So let's say this is three pounds of nitrogen. So if we harvest five ton of fruit, that's 15 pounds of nitrogen per acre. It's not a lot of nitrogen that's removed in the fruit. And what's the next biggest thing? Potassium, about the same amount. But everything else is pretty small that's in the fruit. And we don't see a lot of differences between these two varieties, other than yield, of course. But per ton of fruit, there's not a lot of difference. And we're also looking at prunings, and we're doing this in blackberries, we're doing this in raspberries, and it's very similar between the two. Um, when we get to something like a Marion, we're up in the 25 to 30 pounds per acre range here. But this is 17 pounds of nitrogen per acre in red raspberry when you cane out the floricanes. But you're chopping them between the rows, so over time that's returned to the system. So even if you add this with, let's say, a five ton an acre yield, we're not looking at a huge amount of nitrogen. It's about 35 pounds of nitrogen per acre. It's not huge. It's not huge numbers in these, in these berry crops. So please keep that in mind as you're managing the fertility program. So um, a lot of students who have worked with me over the years and are cur currently working with me in the Organic Blackbird Project and of course the research assistants that I've mentioned and a great group of collaborators, and as I stressed earlier, uh, we will be doing another year's worth of work on the tissue nutrient level and then moving forward on ways to manipulate tissue nutrient and fruit nutrient concentration. So, we've got a lot of time for questions. Quarter two. I told you I'd take a half hour. You started me early and we ended early. Yes? What do you think when you make a foliar application to like, let's say, calcium, and then you do a leaf tissue test later. My tissue test is shown very high levels of calcium. Is that accurate or is the calcium just on the leaves? Yeah, that's a very good question. If I'm foliar applying calcium and I get a <coughs> tissue test, will that give me an artificially high reading or is it in the leaves? Are you washing the leaves? No. And we don't recommend you wash the leaves. And the reason we, we don't recommend that is because if you wash the leaves vigorously, you can leach out potassium and some nutrients like that from the leaves. So we don't recommend you wash them. That means that if there's dust on the leaves, you'll get artificially high readings of iron and aluminum and things like that. Um, copper, if you've been applying copper fungicides. So. It's important to keep good records to kind of explain why, why the values might be really different. Um, so if you're applying foliar calcium and you're testing the leaf of the floricane then, or the, the floricane, if you're testing the floricane leaves, the important thing to understand is these standards that we have, that you have in your handout, are not applicable to floricane leaves. They're very different, and we have data for that now to give you an idea of just how different, but they're very different. They mean nothing. What is nice is to see if a program you're doing is having a positive effect on your uh, floricane leaves. The trouble is, is if you're applying foliar calcium and then you're testing those leaves, the, the short answer is it's artificially high. It isn't necessarily in the leaf, but quite a bit of it will be in the leaf. So if we apply foliar calcium to the leaves, we will increase leaf calcium concentration. The difficulty we have is increasing fruit calcium concentration because calcium only moves in the xylem, the water pipes. It moves with water. And 
And so it's taken up by the roots, it moves to the growing tips to where water's leaving the leaves. And so very little, if any, calcium moves from leaves to fruit. So the only way to increase fruit calcium, I believe, is to apply it to the fruit directly. And the timing of that and the best products to use are something I'm interested in, in researching. Yes? The fish fertilizer you used, was it straight fish fertilizer? Did it, was it the crab plant mixture or what was it? The, well, this is a really good question, Don, because one fish fertilizer is not like another fish fertilizer. And so I just found out today that the fish fertilizer that we used last year was had a very high molasses concentration. So it's just like, you know, it's just like this little black box. Uh, it contained fish, but we have had fish fertilizers that also contain corn steep liquor. Not that I'd want to drink it, but corn steep liquor combination with fish. We've had um, fish, and, and recently fish with molasses. So they're, what we have been using is an emulsified fish and a fish hydrolysate that's about 3% nitrogen, approximately. Sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower. And we test our fertilizers for their actual nutrient concentration because uh, the way it works with organic labeling is, is to get that label, they have to send product in to prove it has that content, but understandably so, they're using different batches of fish or different batches of corn, and things vary, and so we're testing things every year. Any other questions? Thank you, Bernadine.